Hi everyone, my name is Saul Schwartzbach. I'm the CTO of Prestige IT, and today we're here to show you our new enterprise key management product, Frostbite. Um, so Frostbite was built with, to address the pain points with traditional offline key management in mind in the enterprise setting. So this tool is uh, built to mitigate a few of the problems experienced by users today. So problems with typical enterprise key management um, with offline cold storage and private keys Typically, there's a sole encryption password used to encrypt back backups. This password could be lost, stolen, um, and account lockout can occur. Now, you could share this password with multiple members of your organization, but unfortunately, when you do that, it's impossible to keep track of who shared that password with who, how often that's being changed, and how these users are storing that password. Are they keeping it securely, or is it simply on a post-it note at their desk? Um, Oftentimes, uh, you, you know, according to industry, industry best practice, you would want to rotate, uh, rotate the credentials used for encryption every 90 or 180 days. Now, doing this in, at scale with thousands of keys in an enterprise setting is extremely difficult and cumbersome to manage. Now, if you encrypt a backup of one of your private keys and then put that in strict physical storage in redundant locations around the globe, according to true best practice, um, Every time you update those encryption credentials, a physical member of your team would have to go down to that site and actually do version control and swap out the old copies for the newly encrypted ones. Um, obviously, with thousands of keys, this can be very, very difficult to do effectively. And one of the most troubling points we've discovered through our surveys with startups, specifically in the blockchain space, is that more often than not, there's only one team member who is solely responsible for all cold storage and offline key management. So what kind of problems have these issues caused? You may recognize this logo here from Quadriga CX. It was a Canadian exchange that's been in the news quite a bit lately. So the CEO of this exchange was in sole possession of the information for decryption of all of their cold storage reserve assets. Now these were user funds. Um, when the CEO suddenly died, there was no plan in place to um, pass on these dec this decryption information, and as a result, over $190 million of user assets have been locked up and unable to be recovered. Now, due to the nature of the encryption algorithms used here, even if the remaining team members had every best intent in mind, without that decryption information, it would be next to impossible to recover those assets on behalf of the users. So what's happened in response to these problems? So regulations such as in Japan within the last few weeks have required exchanges operating within that jurisdiction to rotate the team member responsible for all cold storage and offline key management at regular intervals. Now while rotating a part that's prone to fail can make the part fail less often, we believe that's not the best approach and we're happy that jurisdictions such as Japan are looking to protect their constituents with these types of regulation, but we believe that the part should simply be redesigned from the ground up. And that is because protecting your keys in today's environment truly is protecting your users, your data, and your business. And that's why today we're going to do a live interactive demo of our new product, Frostbite. Frostbite gives you all the benefits of centralized personnel and credential management with none of the risks. There is no database, either client or server side, of any information, including hashed usernames or passwords. Um, and now we're going to transition to the live demo. It looks like we may have lost HDMI. There we go, sorry about that everybody. So here you can see the home screen for Frostbite. I just want to disclose this is an alpha build and this is the first time we've shown this product to the public. So please, um, we'd appreciate all of your patience if we encounter any technical issues. So um, for today's use case, we're gonna need three volunteers. If people would like to raise their hand, can we have three volunteers from the audience? <laughs> All right. Do we have a third one? Come on up. All right, can we get a round of applause for volunteers? One more, three people, please. So these three people here will be the team of the newest exchange to hit the scene, exchange.new. And this is our CEO, CTO, and COO here. 
and they're going to be our co-founding team. Now, this exchange has just received their fundraising round in Bitcoin, and they're going to secure some private keys so they can move those assets into cold storage for the longer term. All right. So now if we could, uh, we'll go ahead and click the encrypt my private key screen. You can see we have four backup methods here. There's two for personal use and two designed for group or corporate use. We don't have time to go over all of them today. We are going to demo our flagship feature, the vault backup, but I just wanted to add that the personal tools at launch will be free to use. All right, so here you can see our create a vault backup screen. Since it's the first time our team at exchange.new has used the Frostbite encryption software, we will first create a vault key. So if we could click create a vault key, all right, so you can think of the vault key as a physical access badge that would be shared amongst multiple users of the team in the event they need to encrypt or decrypt sensitive information. So here you can see we will select the total number of passwords, which will be three based on our three members of the co-founding team here. And then we will select the minimum required to encrypt and decrypt information. Now to protect our organization, we'll select two of the three. This ensures that no single person ever has the ability to decrypt any uh, cold storage funds without consensus of at least another team, giving them organizational majority. And in the event of team member loss, they would still be able to retain uh, access to decryption. So now we'll have our team members come up one at a time and enter some passwords. All right, so as our team members of exchange.new are entering their credentials, we'll just talk a little bit more about the process. So now this vault key would be kept on the person. Um, in a little bit, we will print out a physical copy. All of these credentials here, there is um, no local or uh, server-side database of any kind. Just keep that in mind. So once all of our passwords are entered, you can see here by default there's a tick box for clear all inputs when the encryption is finished. That'll remove all of the text inputs from the application once we complete this operation. All right. So it looks like our three team members have all input passwords. Um, so we'll go ahead and click Create Vault Key now. And this will start the encryption process. Now, if any of these passwords do not match, it will flag us and let us know. Um, but it, it looks like we should be good here. So now that you can see we successfully generated the encrypted text for the Vault Key, this contains the multi-user credential set. But keep in mind that this has no sensitive information on it at this time. So now you can see we will go to create a QR code. There's some print size options. Today we're using a four by six photo printer that we brought with us. So we'll go ahead and select that there and then we have some advanced print, print options as well. There's things such as what to print and then the error correction level. The error correction level of the QR code is the percentage of the physical printout that could be damaged, missing, um, while the image is still able to be read and the data from it captured. Now the one issue with a higher error correction error correction setting is it requires a higher fidelity camera to be read. We recommend for that reason a medium error correction setting that is compatible with most camera enabled devices today. And then we have some more smaller options as well as the ability to add some additional text to the image. Everything looks good so we'll go ahead and click print now. Great. And then while that's printing, um, I would like you all to keep in mind that we're for speed of use today, we're only going to print one copy, but typically multiple copies would be printed, at least two for every team member, as well as one kept in the office for um, you know, Reddit, uh, easy availability when it's time to decrypt if it's an urgent matter. All right. Right, so today we're using a photo printer because QR codes printed on photo paper can last over 100 years in the right storage environment. They, compared to normal printing methods, they are much more resistant to water and UV light damage. And the only real risk that would need to be mitigated would be risk of fire, which can be done using traditional fireproof storage. All right, so it looks like that our QR code has finished printing. I apologize for the slow speed of our portable printer. Um, it was the best we could do uh, coming all the way from the States today, yeah. So it looks like that is about done. So once that's finished printing, this would be kept on the employee as a type of access badge. So would one of you like to hold on to that? Thank you. <laughs> All right, so now that we've created our vault key or access badge, if you will, we can actually encrypt some sensitive information now for you. Now for our demonstration today, exchange.new again has just received their fundraising and they are looking to um, encrypt some private keys so they can transfer it into cold storage. 
Now this would be kept for a longer period of time, so when they're ready to spend the amount they're fundraising for company needs, they can make it available then. So here, we would, the first step after creating the vault key, which we've already done, is to enter your secret information. This is where you would put your plain text private key or item to be backed up. But to make things easily readable today, we're just going to type Bitcoin Wednesday 71st edition to uh, commemorate this awesome event. And uh, thank you again for joining us tonight. Uh, it's been great. Thank you for having us as well. All right, so now we'll hide the secret information from view. That'll make sure that no unwanted eyes are resting on your sensitive information while you're going through the rest of the process. And now you will scan the QR code for the vault key that was created earlier. <laughs> All right, so now we can see the data, the encrypted text that was read from the QR code. And now we will scroll down and enter two of the minimum passwords required as designated in the earlier process. So we could have two of our team members come up and enter passwords, please. Now the reason we ask for passwords to be entered at the time of encryption as well as decryption is to prevent um, accidental account lockout, to make sure you have those credentials required to decrypt when you go to encrypt the information. This is to protect the user. All right, now once our passwords have been entered, we can click encrypt. And again, if either of the passwords is not correct, um, it would prompt us at this time. But it looks like our volunteers are very good at remembering passwords. Thank you very much. And now you can see the encrypted plain text there below. This has been encrypted with the multi-user credential set that we just created. Now, again, we will print out a separate copy. This is the actual encrypted sensitive information. We can see, again, some printing options, such as the error correction, as spoken on earlier. And the additional text field here is very useful. This is where you could enter the public keys, perhaps attached to the private key, which type of digital asset this is, uh, in, this is uh, controlling, as well as any other relevant information. So now we'll go ahead and click Print. And then we'll start printing the actual encrypted information. So now this is the sensitive information set that is printing now. This would be what would be made multiple copies. This would be kept in strict physical security locations, such as your uh, vault, bank safety deposit box, et cetera. And you would want to make sure that there are copies kept in different locations around, or different physical locations or regions, just to ensure that um, this information would never be lost. But again, for today's purposes, to speed things up, we'll just be printing one copy here. All right. So it looks like that's almost done finishing up. So now we've encrypted our uh, sensitive information, and we're going to put this in some long-term storage. So um, for right now, I believe maybe Nathan can just keep it as his desk. He'll be our safety deposit box for today. All right. So now comes up the question. We've encrypted the assets. We're putting them in a safety deposit box or some type of physical uh, secure storage. And now we're going to deal with what happens when a team member leaves the organization. So one of our team members here has been in a tragic accident <laughs> and is, is now incapacitated and unable to remember his password. We've tried everything, and he just can't remember, right? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for helping us out today. So now we need, what do we do as an organization? We need to hire his replacement. Does someone want to volunteer to be our replacement? Anybody? Just one person? Anyone. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, so no, we have now found our replacement, and the first <laughs> and the first order of business, now that we've found our replacement, is to create a new vault key, because now we need to update the credential set to match the new team members um, on our co-founding team. So now if we go to the Tools menu, you can see we have some tools here, but the one we want to select is Re-Encrypt Vault Key. All right, and now we'll scan the original vault key QR code. If you want to come up and scan that for me, please. All right, great. Then you can see the encrypted text captured. If we could scroll down. All right, and now we'll select the passwords required originally. So it'll be two, and then we'll have the two original members come back up and enter their passwords. And this could be any two of the three passwords that were entered originally. It does not matter entirely. 
All right, and then once we have the original passwords enter, we'll have all three of you input some new ones. So we'll select again the total number and the minimum required. Now at this point, it's important to keep in mind that you can change the total number of passwords on the credential set as well as the minimum number required, and you can change every single password uh, that's on the credential set and still be able to decrypt the original encrypted copy. So now we're gonna have our co-founding team input some new passwords. All right, and then once that last password has been entered, we are able to decrypt or re-encrypt the vault key. You can see again, the tick box for clearing the inputs when it's finished is there by default. Go ahead and click re-encrypt. Again, if any of the passwords do not match or one of the two original passwords input uh, does not belong to the original credential set, it would give us an error and prompt us to re-enter it at this time. So you can see it's going a little slowly. That is because we're using scripts to derive a key pair from this credential set. And now you can see the newly encrypted vault key plain text. So what we will do now is print out a new QR code to issue to our new member of the co-founding team. And then we will destroy the original. So if you could bring the original up here. <laughs> and we'll just go ahead and rip that up. <laughs> All right, so again, you'll, there's the typical options we've seen a few times, if you could, already done. So it's printing now. So now this is the newly updated credential set for our new organizational team members here. And then once that's printed, the next order of business would be to decrypt some of that fundraising. Now it's six months in the future and exchange.new is ready to move some of that out of cold storage to fund some uh, company initiatives at this time. All right, so could our newest team member come up here for the next step? This is just to ensure that um, we will type in one of the new passwords that have been entered, just in case some of our original co-founders use the same one. That is not best practice, which should always be changed. All right, so now we are on the restore screen. So this is the screen where you would actually decrypt your encrypted sensitive information. So now we would give our new access badge, or vault key, to our new team member here. And now we want to decrypt our original encrypted copy. So we will go ahead and hold the QR code up to the screen now. All right. And you can see the captured text of the encrypted data. And now we will scan the actual vault backup. And this was in our safety deposit box here at the podium. And this is the actual sensitive information. Keep in mind the credential set is physically air-gapped and everything is being stored offline on paper. All right, so now you can see the encrypted backup text. And now we will enter the two minimum passwords as designated earlier. And we will have our newest member and one of the original ones come up and enter two of the three required passwords. And now we will click decrypt. So now you can see we have the success message here. And as you can see, there is a timer. So that is the amount of time the sensitive information is able to be viewed before it disappears. And then once you have your, inf your materials you're using to capture this sensitive plain text in front of you, whether it's pen and paper, uh, a camera of some kind, whatever you are using, you would want to have that in front of you before you click show secret information. And then you can see that Bitcoin Wednesday 71st edition, this is the original plain text here, and it has been decrypted using the new credential set. Um, that concludes our visual demonstration today. Um, we just want to say that Frostbite, again, uses no client or server-side database of any kind. There, it's completely true best practice offline key management while still retaining the organizational benefit of centralized credential management. 
So now I just wanted to open the floor up to uh, Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Repeat the questions. Sure. Yeah, yeah. sure. So if there's any question, this is your time. Yeah. Uh, can I come on? Yeah, sure. yeah. Yes. Thank you. Round of applause for our volunteers. Thank you so much, guys. Questions? Yes. Are we using the lessons here? No, no. Uh, I think they're having some trouble. No. Uh, Yes, just to repeat the question. So you're asking if the plain text information was encrypted using the original credential set? Yeah, it could just be decrypted using the old vault key. Yes, it still could be decrypted using the old vault key. And it, is it was originally encrypted using the original credential set and then decrypted using the updated one. Yes. Does that answer your question? Yes. Right. But are they considered to be sensitive data, or how public or private can they be? Right. So the vault key is not considered sensitive data. Since it is just a credential set, there is no sensitive information or private key attached to that printout. It is more or less a physical access badge, if you will, that would be the first step in allowing a user to decrypt. They would have to have that physical QR code, as well as the minimum of total passwords designated. Yes. If I understand the, the advantage of using uh, hardware wallets is so that the, the ultimate secret never gets to a PC or a laptop. Yes. I mean, I have two questions. This laptop is already giving me access to the command in the browser, mm -hmm. and the command that this operating system is completely fucked up. Yeah, yeah. Right. So Right, so just to repeat the question, you're asking how our product cooperates with hardware wallets and whether or not a compromised OS could lead to a compromise of the information being encrypted. Um, so to answer your question, um, it is built to go alongside hardware wallets. Um, basically, that backup seed that you would need to make a recovery of, um, you would use this tool to protect that information if that's your primary um, company wallet. Right. Yes. So uh, starting next year, we are actually planning to distribute this on a sterilized proprietary hardware device running an ephemeral OS, and actually all wireless connectivity chips will be physically removed, guaranteeing it hasn't been tampered with and is truly offline. Okay, so, okay, so you don't have that from the purpose of the hardware website. But it's just, just, using, just using a laptop keyboard mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would defeat the purpose of I mean, hardware wallet, is that correct? Um, I don't think it would defeat the purpose. You still need to back up your 12 or 24 word phrase with those types of hardware wallets. But the purpose of the hardware wallet is that the ultimate secret never goes into the keyboard. Yes. Um, but typically, you would want to encrypt that type of inf information and never store it in plain text. So you would have to use some type of device for that. Right. Um, you could copy and paste it if you're worried about a keylogger um, or some type of keyboard capture. But uh, you know, like mentioned, we do plan to distribute this on a proprietary hardware device that can be trusted. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, why can the hardware device be trusted? I mean, um, I've got a long background in spam and whatever else in um, electronics, and I haven't met this hardware that hasn't been compromised yet. Right. Um, so to ensure that the, that the hardware would not be compromised, we're removing all connectivity devices. Um, while there could be a flaw in the um, OS distribution we come up with, uh, you know, not having any type of network connectivity would mean that without physical access to the device, um, it would unable to be accessed. Um, we are using, uh, we plan to use proprietary Ubuntu distribution that we are creating on uh, running in ephemeral state. Yes?
Um, we're not trying to reinvent uh, the encryption algorithm. What we are... Yeah. Right. Absolutely, and we are more than open to uh, discussing that as well as any other partnerships with vendors who have already, um, that may be a few steps ahead of us. We're just, uh, the reason for the proprietary OS distribution is to mitigate concerns that we have gotten as feedback from um, showcasing this product. Do we have, uh, yes? Um, you could, but if there was ever a flaw found at a later time with the encryption algorithms being used, you likely would not want to have that information that public, such as on Twitter or something of the sort. Uh, I have a question myself, actually. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between a full and a CASA, for example, these days? Uh, was the question, what is the difference between Frostbite and? CASA or the CASA nodes of the Um. To be honest, I, uh, I'm not too familiar, no. Thank you. Do we have any other questions at this time? All right, well thank you very much for having us and giving us the opportunity, thank you.